Chris has sent me some amazing footage on his sourdough baking process. <laughs> Absolutely tremendous. They are the best ones I've ever done. You uh, failed to fail. I failed to fail. I'm oh, sorry. No more pizza base for me. The moment of reckoning. You ready? Yep. No bubbles. No bubbles. Indeed. Risen, but no bubbles. My journey isn't over. <laughs> we need Hendrik's help after all. We do, don't we? Oh dear. And then I gave him a one hour coaching session and I want to share you all the results and the findings. When did you start sourdough baking? Uh, you know what, it was the beginning of the lockdown. It was my daughter who started it first. She started off the starter. And, okay. um, and then uh, um, obviously I got involved with it and now she's left me with the starter and <laughs> I've got it. <laughs> it's, it's living with me now, here it is. <laughs> nice. Yeah, your starter looks amazing. I saw it in the footage. It's very active, right? Yeah, well, it's, it's rye um, that I use, which you recommended. So, yeah, yeah. It, it, it makes a makes a big difference, actually. And um, let me just put on one video here. And uh, that's you in the end, slicing the bread open. And that would be actually my first question. What would you like to achieve with your bread? Wait a second. I'm putting on the, I'm putting yeah. on the video. The moment of reckoning. Ready? Yep. No bubbles. No bubbles. Indeed. Risen, but no bubbles. My journey isn't over. <laughs> we need Hendrik's help after all. We do, don't we? Oh dear. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, what, what do you want to improve on your bread? Yeah, more bubbles, more um, more elasticity, and you know, just um, that. That normal sort of sourdough um, that you you know that you, you you see when it's done properly with lots of bubbles, lots of air. Okay. And, yeah. And how do, how how satisfied are you with the taste? Do you think it's good? Do you think it could be a little bit more sour? Or I think the taste is fine. I think mm -hmm. I think it tastes good. Um, yeah. I mean, you know, fresh bread is is delicious, isn't it? As it as mm -hmm. it is. I think it. It, it tastes pretty good. Um, the texture maybe hasn't got that um, sort of chewiness to it. It, it. It's more like a wholemeal bread mm -hmm. you know, that 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 you get rather than that last elasticity that you know, that you tend to get okay. in sourdough. Okay. All right. Yeah, I think t at least to me the perfect bread is you have that crispness on the outside and then you have a very fluffy inside and also a little bit of crispness from the bottom and i think from the outside it looks nice and crispy but i think the inside looks relatively dense as yeah. far as i can see right absolutely that's right yeah, very but dense. i have good news i think uh i know what you're doing wrong <laughs> perfect <laughs> I would suggest that we, by the way, thank you so much for sending me all that footage. That was super amazing. Um, maybe let's just start from the beginning and then just go through each of the individual steps and I can give you some feedback on what to improve. Brilliant. Brilliant. Okay, let me start by sharing some footage on the flower. By the way, um, when the video plays, we can't speak, we're muted, just so I've, it's just so, so that you know. Okay, we're putting on the footage of the flower now. 500 grams of the white organic flour, 500 grams of the wholemeal organic flour, and then I'm going to do 70% hydration this time. So I think one thing you're doing right already is, as far as I can see, you have great flour. Oh, good. So that's where many people struggle. They don't find good flour, but the brand of flour that you have and 50% whole wheat, 50% bread, bread flour, I think it's a good mixture. Just what I noticed it is that when you mix the water, it all felt relatively dry, didn't it? What was relatively dry? So in the end, it, there was still a lot of flour. It didn't feel like you could so easily incorporate the flour. Um, it took a little bit longer than it normally does for me. 
let me just put the video on here one more time and just have a look at how there's still quite a lot of flour on the edges of the container in the end. 500 grams of the white organic flour, 500 grams of the wholemeal organic flour, and then I'm going to do 70% hydration this time. So when you compare that with the doughs from my videos, um, it feels that the dough is relatively stiff. This is not per se bad. Um, it's just something that I wanted to point out mm. a little bit on what kind of bread you want. Do you want it to be um, dry on the inside or do you want it to be a little bit wet as well? Um, I would say the best bread is when the inside is a little bit wet and you have this amazing consistency as well. So I think you need to upgrade the water a little bit that you're using. And the water depends on your flour. And you have a very, very strong bread flour and paired with the whole meal flour, you should easily be able to go to around 80% hydration with your flour. Okay. So that's something I would change. Okay. Um, what I like to do is I, I do have this small chart here, which I prepared. And then I always like to recommend, depending on the protein that you have inside of your flour, how much water you should be using roughly. But you are using 50% wholemeal and wholemeal in general can absorb even more water. Okay. So don't just draft guidelines, but this is something that you have to figure out for your flour pretty much. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. And what I like to do is I like to do a small test um, where I would just take a few, um, I would just make a few bowls with flour and then I would add some water. Then I just let that sit, stir that a little bit. And then after around an hour or so, I just test if I can get a little bit of a gluten network inside. And that way I can determine what is the right percentage of water for my flour. This is where I see many people struggling because yeah, it really depends on the flour you have. I would say eight, around 80% is probably gonna work for you, but I always recommend to do one test for your flour. That way you know what your flour is capable of. So what am I looking for in that gluten network? And what, what, what do I want to see? That's an excellent question. Um, I'm just checking if I, yes, I'm just going to put a video on the flower test here and then we can discuss afterwards. Perfect. So the more water you add to your dough, the more easily you can stretch it, the more extensible uh, your dough is. And if you have a very stiff, let's say car tire, for instance, and you're trying to inflate that with your mouth, it's very hard, it's almost impossible. Mm -hmm. But now if there was not as much pressure inside, you would be able to inflate it. And that's the same with the dough. When you have a very stiff dough, and I think you have with around the 70% hydration, plus I saw that flour, that it's very hard for your sourdough to inflate the dough. And that means you won't be able to get those nice pockets of air that you think about. So you need to increase the hydration a little bit. That makes it easier for the yeast to gas up the dough. Okay. And I have one more video and that's from an old video. And there I was just showing the actual effects of the gluten because the gluten inside of your dough that's what the yeast is inflating mm -hmm. <laughs> so um i just i just washed away all the gluten that's something you can do you just make your dough and then you just pour keep pouring water over it and in the end you will just have your gluten and then you can even try inflating that. I was trying to inflate it with helium. That actually didn't work. But just with the regular air, I wanted to make a, a sourdough balloon, pretty much. But... <laughs>
<laughs> so where do I get my helium from? Then? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that's what you're trying infl to inflate. Yeah. And when it's very stiff, it's harder for the yeast to inflate it. So adding water makes a more extensible dough. It will spread out faster, uh, but it's also easier then for the yeast to inflate it. Right. Does that make sense? That makes perfect sense. Yeah. Okay, good. Um, and I think this this flour hydration test is something I would recommend you to definitely do just to get a little bit of a feeling for your own flour. Yeah. Okay, I'll do that. Awesome. Okay, then the next next up, um, you were talking about your starter, and I think there you did really well because your starter looks nice and active, nice and healthy. Let me just put on the footage here. One more time for us to have a look. So this is where it all goes wrong, and where I'm going to show you how I make my pizza bases. So I've got um, the starter, and I've got about twenty odd grams of salt, Himalayan pink salt. Um, so that starter's it's about five and a half hours, maybe six hours or so. It's been growing. So I'm going to put that. So yeah, I think your starter is looking really great. You mentioned you fed it around six hours ago. It then doubled in size. So that's good, good sign of activity. Cool. Uh, you always want to have a balance between not fermenting too slow and not fermenting also too fast, I would say. So with your starter, keep doing whatever you're doing. That's working fine. That's good to know. Qu question, the Himalay Himalayan pink salt. What's that about? <laughs> It's just, I don't know, it's just fancy salt. It's pink. <laughs> it comes from the Himalayas. I had it before. Did you notice any taste difference in it? No. 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 <laughs> it tastes exactly the same. But it looks like, uh, you know. <laughs> Great. Okay, so starter, I think that's perfect. And then next up, you're adding dough strength. And I think there you're also doing very well. However, based on the hydration that you have, you mm. could actually skip the whole dose strength building part at all. Uh, for that level of water that you're using, I'm not even kneading my dough. I'm just stirring it together. And then I just let that sit for the, the whole process pretty much. Yeah. That's something that you can also do if you run out of time and you don't want to knead or so, you can just go a little bit lower in hydration, but then you also don't have to knead as much. But for, uh, yeah, for your dough and for the consistency you have, I would probably just mix everything together and then let that sit without really doing any sort of kneading. Of course, you have to homogenize everything a little bit just mm. to make sure that the starter is everywhere. But yeah. other than that, yeah, you could just let that sit. That's what people do for a no neat sourdough bread. Yeah. The problem, though, is you go less, you go down in terms of water, then you don't get that wet, nice crump yeah that's right so i would always recommend to go the for the kneading approach at least at the start to also develop a uh, feeling for the dough but uh, yeah if you want to try no knead definitely works as well and i actually where is this here so i made a chart on that before so this is what i do for my no knead bread also, again, depending on your flour's protein percentage, because the protein, mostly gluten, 80% is gluten, is responsible for absorbing the water. And um, yeah, just have a look. You use 70%, right? So you're around in the zone of my no neat recipe. And I think that also reflects uh, the consistency of your dough. Yeah. Yeah. But other than that, when I look at the technique of how you knead, um, I think you are doing this perfectly fine. So I'm just going to put up one more video again of sh that shows how you need. So that's been resting for about 15 minutes. So I'm going to do a letter um, fold. Put it over.
Yeah, so based on the kneading that you're doing, what I recommend when you had your dough inside of the pot, I saw, for instance, you didn't stretch your dough as much. Um, try stretching it a little bit more, especially yep. at the start of the whole process. The more you stretch your dough, the bigger the two surfaces are that you are gluing together pretty much. So if you just only stretched a little bit, you have a smaller surface that you glue together. That's why your letter fold technique also works so well because you have this huge surface and then you can just glue the dough together. And this way you are making the dough stick to itself and that's what creates your strong gluten network. Um, so I th there you did everything right in terms of dough strength. It might be that now that you improve the water a little bit that you have to knead for a few more minutes. Mm -hmm. um, what I like, what I like to do is I just always like to stretch the dough a little bit and look for what they call the window pane effect. That's also yeah. what I did at the start with the flower water hydration test. Yeah, yeah. window pane. I, I would recommend before you do this test, let your dough sit for 10 minutes or so, just because after the kneading, sometimes it's hard to do the test. Just let your dough sit 10 minutes before you do this window pane test. And once you have it, you're ready to roll your dough. It's looking very good. Cool. And the mistake that you're doing, the one mistake that you're doing, yes. I think was already at the end of this video, visible at the end of this video. Okay. And I think that's where all is uh, going south. Well, not going so south, your bread looks amazing anyways, but still, I think this is the one thing that you have to improve on. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, I'm just putting up another chart here of the typical, so this is the typical uh, workflow, I would say for a sourdough bread, you're readying your starter, then you're mixing your flour and your water. Um, you don't necessarily have to do that only when it's colder in your room. I notice now that my dough takes around 12 hours to ferment, so I skip that. But uh, if it's warm for you, what's the temperature in your place right now? About 23 degrees. Okay. Then you actually, you don't have to do this step. At 23 degrees, I think you can just skip that. So you mix together all the ingredients, your sourdough starter, your flour and water, and your salt. Mm -hmm. And then... Number four, and this is what you're this is what you're not doing. What you are doing is you are skipping to point five directly. Okay. Yeah. You are you are dividing your bread already, you're shaping it, but you're missing this whole part of this is called the bulk fermentation, where you ferment your dough together in bulk. You're dividing your dough already and you're not letting your dough ferment. And okay. And this is why you're not getting those pockets of air. Your dough is simply not fermenting for long enough. Okay. I do have a small table here and please take this with a grain of salt. This shows you, I marked this here, based on 20% sourdough starter. That's what you use, mm -hmm. if I remember correctly. Yeah, correct. and yeah. Let's go to 24 degrees Celsius here on the left-hand side, 75 F. Mm -hmm. And the green thing here means for how long it should ferment approximately so mm -hmm. 6.35 hours um, and the bulk fermentation where you just let your dough sit together in bulk is around four hours then and then the proofing is another three hours and as far as i saw in your video your dough has been sitting in the at room temperature for maybe an hour or one and a half hours or so was it was it that that much or was it more or am i missing something uh Yes, I think we left it at room temperature for about an hour or so. And then I think I put it in the pr fridge. Mm -hmm. How long did I put it in the fridge for? Um, I think you said a few hours or so. Yeah, I think it's about sort of four or five hours or something like that. Mm -hmm. So the fridge is also, of course, going to slow down the whole fermentation mm. process. And I have another small chart here. Um, and this chart just shows... It's just a sourdough. It's at 100% hydration, and it shows the size increase of the sourdough mm -hmm. depending on what you feed your sourdough starter. So, I mean, of course, for the one-to-one-to-one, -to -one -to -one, that would be, let's say, 100 grams of sourdough starter, 
100 grams of flour and 100 grams of water. So you include a lot of sourdough starter at the start. So that's of course a little bit faster, but just have a look here at around 25 degrees Celsius. And then after around four hours, the first blue line here peaks, right? Yeah. And you didn't even ferment that long. Okay. Plus for you, it's even colder. So at 23, the whole process probably takes twice as long. So what you what you pretty much didn't do is what I did mm. here in the video with inflating the gluten, that's something you didn't do. <laughs> so you didn't inflate your gluten long enough and that's the yeah. problem. Okay. And I want to show you a small trick because the problem is with the temperatures and your sourdough starter, it's probably going to be different than mine. So just relying on a time is likely not going to get you the bread that you want. Mm -hmm. And for that, what I like to do is I always like to extract a small sample from the dough. So after adding the starter, after kneading, I'm extracting a small piece of the dough and I'm using that to monitor the size increase. And the bulk fermentation is done. That's what many people say, the moment that your dough roughly doubled in size. So when you see your dough is doubled, then you are ready to go pretty much. And um, this doubling in size, I would go for less probably. Although with your flour, you could likely go for a doubling in size, but maybe just go for a 50% size increase. Okay. Um, and here I'm just putting on the video. <laughs> uh, yeah, so this this is something that's going to allow you to nail that bulk fermentation process. Just take a small piece of the dough mm -hmm. and put it into another jar. It should be of cylindrical shape um, so that you can see it. And then yeah. wait for, start with a 50% size increase. That's something that your flour definitely supports. <clears throat> and then you know that your dough has nicely inflated. Cool. If you ferment for too long, then your flour starts to break down again. Yes. Um, that's something that also some people experience. What they experience is suddenly the dough is sticky. Like your dough, it was nice, and suddenly it becomes very sticky. You can't mm. do anything with it anymore. And that can happen when you ferment for too long. So it's better to ferment a little bit less, like the way you were doing. Uh, you fermented less, you didn't have so many nice bubbles inside. You still have a, had a little bit of oven spring, but um, it's better than doing that than fermenting for too long because then it's just going to be a very, very, very flat pizza. Yeah. Yeah. However, it's also a flat pizza when you don't inflate your bread dough at all. So if there's no gas inside, it cannot expand in the oven. Mm. So you need to find a balance between fermenting just enough and fermenting not too much. And that's where this small sample jar is really a good trick. I mean, we take the sample after kneading. After, yes, after you added your sourdough starter. Yes, after kneading. Um, I would do it after, at the start, I would directly extract it after I started to mix in my starter. So I mix in my starter, wait a little bit, need some more, wait a little bit, need some more. But the problem with that is that after all, after you've done all the sets of kneading, you homogenize your dough a little bit better so that you spread it, the sourdough starter evenly everywhere inside of the mixture. So it's gonna be more reliable than extracting it at the start because extracting at the start, it might be that you just didn't mix your dough good enough. So it's much safer to extract it after the last stage of kneading. Okay. So knead, fold, and then extract a sample, put that to one side and let that let that grow 50% in the, to start off with little baby steps. And then maybe I can get to yes. eventually. So the more you ferment, of course, the more fluffy it's going to be in the end. Right? So this is something you have to play with, mm. but you have amazing flour. You have great bread flour and great wholemeal flour. So mm. your flour, as far as I can see, supports that. <clears throat> okay. Okay. And, um,
<clears throat> I was working on this one infographic and I'm just going to put this here. This may be a little bit too sciencey, <clears throat> but I just wanted to share regardless what happens um, inside of your flower. So when you're mixing flour and water, this starts the germination process. Mm -hmm. So um, the flower pretty much, the seed pretty much just, just wants to germinate. And then you have two enzymes inside. <clears throat> you have the amylase and you have the proteas. What's that actually? Please fix my English pronunciation. Is this amylase or how would you pronounce this? <laughs> amylase. 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 Yeah, yeah that, that sounds good. And the second one? Proteas. Proteas. Okay. <laughs> so those are the two things that are happening inside of your dough. Um, that's also why you can't keep your dough for too long at room temperature. The amylase is helping you to break down the starch into sugars. And this is what the germ needs. The germ needs the sugars to be able to sprout. And so does your sourdough love this. So your sourdough is using the sugars that it created, that the that this breakdown pretty much creates. And that gives your sourdough sort of the rocket fuel towards the end of the fermentation. At the same time, at the same time, you have the proteas, and the proteas is responsible for um, converting the storage proteins into other proteins. And this also breaks down your flour. So at some point you won't be able to inflate your dough anymore. And um, yeah, this is also why sourdough or why slow fermented bread in general might be a little bit healthier because you are not eating the raw grain anymore. You are just breaking down this into something different. Mm. Oh, that's interesting. But if you ferment for too long, it's broken down too much. It might be super healthy, but then you won't get that nice oven spring. So again, you have to find a balance between yeah, not for, not fermenting too short and not fermenting too long. So what you're saying is pizza is good for you. L slow fermented pizza, yes. So what you did is you skipped the bulk fermentation completely. You directly went into the proofing stage. And let me put up the footage. So, Hendrik, this has been sat here room temperature for about an hour. Um, I'm going to give it a poke test, like you say. So, if I poke it with my finger, it's kind of bouncing back. Uh, there's some bubbles on it, so I'm going to put this in the uh, in the fridge, let it cool down, ready to go in the oven. I actually, uh, one second, because I think I missed one video where you actually showed how you shaped the bread. I'm just putting this on one more time. It could be improved a little bit, but I think you did it already very, very, very well. So there is not that much to improve. Okay. So it's just that you that you did your shaping uh, technique a little bit too soon. You should have waited after the bulk fermentation to do your shaping. Right, I see. Let me yeah. just put up one more time the footage of how I shape my bread, maybe just for you as an inspiration of what to do. Mm -hmm. And actually in this case, I am bulk fermenting. So I'm not dividing the, the dough into two batches. I'm having one large batch of dough. And then at the end of the bulk fermentation, that's why it's called bulk, you have maybe 100 loaves at the same time <clears throat> that you ferment. And then you have to divide the dough exactly the same way you did. And then you need to, because then after you divide it, it's not looking nice and round. So you have to round it up a little bit let it sit on the bench, that's called bench resting, and then you shape it 15 minutes later. I see. Okay, putting on the video.
so yes, <clears throat> in this case, what I did is I only had one dough fermenting at the same time and I did the pre-shape because sometimes in some cases, what you do is when you pre-shape, when you round up the dough, you also even out the crumb a little bit. So it depends on what kind of crumb you want. Do you want to have more large pockets or do you want to have tinier pockets of air? Um, so I think in your case, you, you're, you want that really large open crumb, right? That's right, yeah. Then I would recommend you that maybe for now, you only do one dough at a time. So don't do two, just do one dough at a time, just okay. to until, until you master this. Mm -hmm. And you don't even have to do this pre-shaping that I showed you, just like you did in the shaping video. I don't have it right now, but flip over the container and then shape your bread. Um, what I saw is, I mean, you flipped over your container and then you used your spatula to help removing the dough from the container. Mm -hmm. Just flip it over, wait a minute or so, your dough should come out just fine. Okay. All right. But you have a great container already, so I think that should work. Mm -hmm. And you also don't really have to flour the surface, just flour the top of the dough, give it really a good amount of flour, and mm -hmm. then flip it over, and then it's not going to start sticking. Okay, brilliant. In case you want to make two doughs at the same time, then you have yeah. to take the large chunk of dough, place it on your unfloured surface and divide the dough and then do this pre-shaping technique that I just showed you. That way yeah. you could make two breads, three breads, 10 breads, ho however many you want to make. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But it comes at a cost of evening out the crumb. Right, okay. Does that make sense? Just could you explain that evening out the crumb? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> okay, so um, you have those pockets of air inside of your dough and they're increasing as we ferment, right? Because the yeast and the bacteria, they are inflating our dough. Mm -hmm. Now it's a very puffy mixture of dough. Yeah. When I take this puffy mixture of dough and I just rounden it up, I'm just condensing the dough again. Uh, yeah. So some of yeah. the large pockets are also going to be condensed even further, right? Yeah. yeah. So that's what happens. That's why also you shouldn't, you should only very touch the dough very, very rarely. The less you touch your dough after mm. you're adding your dough strength and the more gentle you are, the better and the more open the crumb is going to be. Okay. All right. That's good to know. And I saw you touching the dough with the wetted hands, and that's exactly what you should do. So I think from dough handling, I would say you're doing it already um, everything right. So your technique is actually pretty good, but mm. it was just that you were missing on this fermentation part. You yeah. didn't ferment long enough. Yeah. So mastering that fermentation, I would say that's 80 to 90% of making an amazing sourdough bread. Mm. Yeah, that's a pretty simple fix as well. Yeah, right? right? Yeah. <laughs> so when I saw the videos and then I just saw this one thing where you just shaped the directives, I thought, okay, I'm able to help Chris. Chris is going to uh, improve so much after having uh, had a chat with him. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And then you're doing the proofing. And I think for the proofing, you're doing everything right already. I'm just going to put up the footage one more time. So, Hendrik, this has been sat here at room temperature for about an hour. Um, I'm going to give it the poke test, like you say. So, if I poke it with my finger, it's kind of bouncing back. Like that. There's some bubbles on it. So, I'm going to put this in the, uh, in the fridge, let it cool down, ready to go in the oven. So that's perfect. So you're doing the finger poke test. That's a very reliable way to know that your dough is done proofing. It's just that you have to do this after the bulk fermentation, after shaping. Mm -hmm. So the, bulk, the dough always relaxes a little bit the moment you let it sit. And uh, the finger poke test just shows it's inflated a little bit from the gas and it's also quite extensible. And that's where the finger poke test is perfect. What you could do is, at that stage, when the finger poke test passes, um, I wouldn't say it's safe to put the dough for another five hours into the fridge because you would be running into that over fermentation area. Mm -hmm. I would use the finger poke test <clears throat> and then shortly before it passes, 
exactly at the stage that you showed in the video. So that was perfect. Take your dough and just put it into the freezer for 30 minutes. Okay, right. Because in the freezer, your dough cools down. Well, at least the surface, the center is still a little bit hot, so it will continue fermenting, but that's okay. But then the scoring in the end is so much easier on a cold dough. If you try to score a, a dough at room temperature, I sometimes find it very hard. The dough just sticks on my scoring knife. Yeah. I don't know if you ever experienced that. Yes, I have. Yeah, and it sort of creases as you do. Yeah. Exactly. So that's where this freezer hack is just amazing. Mm. So keep doing whatever you're doing there. So with the finger poke test, and then try to use the freezer. You might be running into a time issue though, because if you start early in the morning, you do the bulk fermentation, and then the proofing at room temperature at the current at the current uh, temperature for you, it's likely going to take maybe ten to twelve hours. Really. Wow. So it could be that that's already too late. You don't want to bake the bread. And that's why people then transfer the dough directly into the fridge and let it sit in the fridge overnight. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So for that, rather than letting it proof at room temperature, if you run out of time, <clears throat> just take it and place it directly inside of your fridge. The problem is inside of the fridge, the finger poke test is no longer working. So there's no reliable way to say that your dough is done proofing inside of the fridge. That's what I don't like about using the fridge. Your temperature might be a little bit different than mine. It could take three hours faster for you, three hours less. So that's something you have to experience, experiment a little bit on. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And now you have an amazing video as well on you proofing inside of the fridge. Let me put that on here. So the dough has been in the fridge for a couple of hours. So let's go and have a look at it. Oh, test. Unusually for me, that's not looking too bad. So let's go and put the oven on. So um, the, the finger poke test is amazing, but it only works at room temperature because the viscosity of the dough changes a little bit. And that's yeah. why the finger poke test no longer works. Yeah. That's why it is. <laughs> <laughs> So either you proof at room temperature using the finger poke test, mm. or you move it directly into the fridge. And then I would wait for at least 16 to 24 hours inside of mm. your fridge. Okay. The one day I was, I was using my fridge as well, and I placed my dough inside of the fridge. And at the same day, I went shopping and then I was cooking and I opened the fridge quite a lot. And so the temperature in my fridge was different and I over fermented my bread because I would normally always wait for 16 hours at four degrees Celsius. But then suddenly with all the temperature changes, suddenly it was way faster and I had a quite flat bread. So this is also something you have to take into consideration. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think it does. Okay. <laughs> Uh, and then I have one more funny video of you, which I just want to put up here. <laughs> so the belt. <laughs> you know what? This happens to me all the time when I'm recording my YouTube videos. So I just had to show this footage of you here. There's so many times where I just forget what I actually wanted to say. And yeah. Yeah. it takes so much time to record a proper video. Yeah, no, it's tricky, isn't it? it is tricky. Yeah. Yeah, so how to speak? How the hell is that? You know? Yeah. <laughs> when somebody presses the camera button and go, well, that's it. You forget, forget how to speak. <laughs> yeah, awesome. Okay, and now, Chris, I don't know what kind of superpower oven you have, but you really do have an amazing oven. Uh, it has bread baking functionality. I was surprised to see you activating your oven. Oh, yeah. <laughs> bread. Bread. Flatbread. I usually get flatbread, but I don't want it this time. White bread. Oh, no, there's yours. Oops. Go for 215 degrees. I'm going to start warming it up, and I'm going to put some water in the bottom as well. Great. 
Baking temperature wise, I would go a little bit higher. I would go to 230 degrees Celsius. Okay. Yes. Cool. Uh, too hot is not good, but too warm is, uh, sorry, too cold is also not good. So in my exper experiments, 230 degrees Celsius seems to be the sweet spot between all the different parameters. Cool. And, and how long would you cook for, bake for? Um, so the with steam, it's always around 25 minutes. So 25 minutes with steam at 230 degrees Celsius, so with your bowl of water. Mm -hmm. And then actually the bread is already done in my case. You can measure that the bread is done by just using a thermometer and just checking the core temperature. And when it's at about 92 degrees Celsius, your bread is done. The only problem is it doesn't have a crust yet. And to get that crust, you have to remove that steam. Okay. What you could do actually, what, what I like to do is after the first 25 minutes, my bread is already done. I'm checking the temperature and then I'm just letting it cool down without a crust. And I'm just storing that inside of my fridge for a few days or maybe even a week or so. And then when I want to have fresh bread, all I do is I heat my oven to 230 degrees Celsius again. I put my bread in there and I let it bake for another 15 minutes and I have fresh amazing bread. Wow. So in case you want to time it, for instance, let's say uh, you want to have a bread for Sunday, but you only have time on Friday to make it or so, that's really a great trick to, yeah, to, it's called par baking, just to have, yeah, just bake it half time and then just finish the bake on another day. Mm -hmm. Okay. But, but if you bake it at the same time, so the first 25 minutes, I would say they are set. So as much steam as possible, I think you're doing great there. I have one more improvement suggestion. Mm -hmm. And then the period after, um, that depends on how dark you like your bread. Do you like it to be more on the dark brownish side, a little whiter? Personally, I like it a little bit darker. So I'm going to bake it for at least another 15 to 20 minutes or so. Mm -hmm. But that's something that depends on your wife and your kids, whatever they like. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> okay. Did that make sense? Yeah, that makes perfect sense. Okay. So, Twenty-five minutes with the steam, and that, and then set 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 the water out and just crust it up for fifteen minutes. Yes. Yeah. Or twenty, or maybe even twenty-five, depending on your personal. Uh, preference what you like yeah 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 okay then i took a small video here of you loading the bread and i found that very interesting let me put that okay. here so this is a moment of truth that's what i've got to sprinkle a little bit of flour on here so you don't stick They look loads better than normal. <laughs> These are about <laughs> the best ones that I've ever done. And that's it. That's the job. <laughs> By the way, cute dog in the background. Thank you. <laughs> How old is he or she? She is, what is she now? She's, um, Three months. Which kind of dog is it? Uh, she's a Alsatian, German Shepherd. Ah, wow. I didn't know that German Shepherds look like that so young. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're pretty cute at that age. Uh, is it a she or a he? It's a she, yeah. She's called Somo. Somo. Does she like sourdough bread? She, no, <laughs> she doesn't eat it, actually. No. <laughs> okay. She likes mackerel. <laughs> <laughs> mackerel mackerel you know fish uh, yeah the fish yeah <laughs> my mom's dogs love sourdough do they they're crazy about it yeah, <laughs> oh, well, yeah it's, 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 it's actually that? it's actually funny because dogs have a genetic mutation that allows them to digest gluten whereas wolves don't have it oh really yeah <laughs> just some random piece of information yeah what is interesting <laughs> <laughs> okay, so when you 
loaded your breath. You had that tray of water at the bottom. It was boiling. I could see some steam. Perfect. Yeah. You placed your bread inside. Still, uh -huh. your bread is going to be exposed to the heating element, which you have on top, right? Yeah. So you have steam that mitigates the whole situation a little bit, but still with the heating element, um, it's going to get very, very hot directly on top of your bread. And that's, I don't know if you have another tray, maybe a third tray, or you use a bowl at the bottom instead of a tray, place that directly on top of your bread. Yeah. That's going to work like a sauna almost. So the steam is going upwards and it's going to be trapped here below this additional tray, shielding from the heating elements yeah. that you have on top. Mm -hmm. And this sauna environment really makes sure that you don't form a crust too quickly and you will have more oven spring. Okay, cool. So that's a really great way to bake without a Dutch oven. You could, of course, get a Dutch oven, but in my experience, it's the, it's just, you get the same results. There's not that much of a difference. Mm -hmm. So just place another tray on top. Okay, cool. Great hack. And I saw you placing the preheated tray uh, on your surface in the kitchen. <clears throat> the problem is it's not that thick, right? This tray, it's very relatively thin. Yeah. I don't know which kind of material it is, but I would place another, cool, is it called a cooling rack? Yeah, yeah. I would place a cooling rack below just yeah. to make sure that the tray doesn't cool down so quickly. Okay. Yeah. Because you also want to have high heat coming from the bottom at the start. That's relatively important. And with this cooling rack, uh, you would make sure that um, you don't lose so much, so much heat at the start. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. <clears throat> then I also saw you placing some flour there on your tray. Uh -huh. What I would recommend you to do is, <clears throat> I don't know if you have semolina flour. Um, okay. Typically, I, I don't know, here in Germany, most people have it somewhere. Uh -huh. and you just take some semolina flour and you don't, you don't put that on the tray, but you put that on top of your, of your dough. Okay. So you just, you, you just give them a good rub with uh, semolina flour. Mm -hmm. And that also makes sure that they don't stick in the end. Brilliant. If you have issues with sticking, regardless, you can always use a small parchment paper on top of your tray. That also works. Yeah, yeah. It comes at the cost, parchment paper comes at the cost of reducing the heat that you transfer from the tray to your actual dough. So yeah. I would prefer the Simolina approach, but yeah. parchment paper could also work. You have to experiment, experiment a little bit on what works best for you. Cool. Okay, and then you baked your breads, and uh, let's have a look at how they look like. I think they looked amazing. <laughs> Absolutely tremendous. They are the best ones I've ever done. I don't know what I've done differently. I don't know what I did wrong. You uh, failed to fail. I failed to fail. Oh, sorry. No more pizza base for me. Well, thank you, Hendrik, anyway. Uh, obviously, your tips have paid dividends. It's only took me a year of baking, but I finally got there. <laughs> from the outside, they look very nice already, I gotta say. Yeah. But but even from the crumb, uh, if I just put the video of the crumb here one more time, let's check the crumb that you had. The moment of reckoning. You ready? Yeah. No bubbles. Indeed. Risen, but no bubbles. My journey isn't over. <laughs> we need Hendrik's help after all. We do, don't we? Oh dear. <laughs> so they rose nicely in the oven. So you inflated the dough, but it just simply wasn't inflated uh, long enough. And I think you should also bake it a little bit longer because I just heard that when you were <clears throat> slicing the bread, it almost went through like butter. I didn't really hear any of that crackling sound that you should get when you have a really crisp crust. Yeah. And also when I saw the bottom of your bread, then I saw that there was almost no crust at all um, near the bottom of your bread. That's okay for now. But I think to me, at least, you need to have also that crispness from the bottom and you get that 
by um, using the tray, maybe heating it for a little bit hotter, making the tray even a little bit hotter, or mm -hmm. at some point, maybe opting to use a stone as the base on which you bake your bread. Okay. Yeah, but Chris, I think even the bread you made right now, it's probably already tasting very, very good. Um, maybe take yeah. a take take note on the sourness. You should also note now that you ferment a little bit longer that the acidity should increase slightly. Right. Yeah, that'd be interesting to to note the difference, won't it? Yeah. Yeah, but I think you're just you technique wise. I think that's already very good. It was just the fermentation aspect that you need to focus on a little bit more. Well, that's pretty easy to uh, to resolve, isn't it? Yeah, I think so. Use the small sample that I suggested, mm -hmm. and that's gonna yeah, that's gonna make you always bulk ferment on time. Brilliant! Can't wait. <laughs> <laughs> Do you already have a the next dough prepared? I've got the starter here, so <laughs> nice. Put this to good use. <laughs> so if you were if you were to make your bread now, I would just mix everything together. It would probably be ready at um, eight hours. Uh, it would probably be ready at three a.m. I don't know when you get up, at what time you typically get up, but that might be a little bit too early. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, can I? I'm usually up at around about five. Mm -hmm. 530. Mm -hmm. so is there anything that I could do? I could I could slow the fermentation down then a little bit, couldn't I? Would, yes. Would you slow that, put it in the uh, fridge during the bulk fermentation for this? Or... Just use less sourdough starter. Rather than using a 20%, use... I Actually, what you can do is you can set up a dough right now after we spoke and mm. use 5% sourdough starter. Okay. So very little inoculation rate, that's what they call it. Mm -hmm. And then just let that sit overnight. And I think by 5 a.m. Uh, tomorrow morning, whenever you get up, it should probably have increased 50% in size. Okay. So that's through the bulk fermentation. And then, mm -hmm. point, then approve it. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So based on the amount of starter that you're using, mm. you can also control the fermentation process. Okay. So uh, yeah, that's, that's um, I mean, of course there are other factors as well, like the, what I talked about, the, the starch breaking down and the gluten breaking down, but with your flour, you can ferment for a relatively long period of time. I would say overall, your flour can be at room temperature for maybe 20 hours or so before it completely breaks down. So oh. any anything less than that should be safe. So 5% starter or maybe 10% starter, start with 5%. So it might be ready at 5 a.m. It might be ready at 8 a.m. or 10 a.m. You just have to check. Yeah. Then you shape it, proof it, and then you would have fresh bread tomorrow around lunchtime, probably. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, did this make sense to you? That makes a lot of sense. Yeah, that's really helpful. Hope you had fun and enjoyed this video. Definitely thank you again, Chris, for sending me all that amazing footage in advance. I would be very curious to see how your sourdough looks like the next time you try to bake. Hope you all learned something new. Happy baking and may the gluten be with you.